right, so, um, so thanks to Susan for the lovely introduction and uh, thanks to OSA for inviting me here to speak. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the research that we're doing in silicon photonics uh, at IBM and give a little bit of an, ind an industrial perspective. Um, so, um, so all of you may not have direct experience with data centers, but I can guarantee you that all of you have probably accessed a data center multiple times already today. Um, these are, here's a picture of a Google data center, um, and uh, they're basically large warehouses full of computers, um, and uh, they're used by any company, any, any institution that is storing um, and uh, analyzing a whole bunch of data. So it's just a warehouse full of computers, and all these computers need to talk to each other. Um, so we have a little bit of an issue. Um, these warehouse, these uh, data centers can be, you know, the size of football fields. Um, so if you're trying to transmit data over a short distance, say, you can use a copper cable. Um, but as our data transmission speeds get faster and faster, the length that you can go over copper gets smaller and smaller. So now we're at, you know, less than a meter. Um, and of course, the other answer there is fiber optics, and uh, we're very familiar with that. Fiber optics is the backbone of the internet um, over these very long distances. Um, so that's great, but currently, a lot of the technology that's used for the internet, um, you know, there aren't so many links. If you want to send um, information from here to California, you're talking maybe tens of thousands of parts per year. You can afford to have um, very complex uh, machinery, very expensive machinery. It's a low volume, high margin industry um, that has extremely high performance. Uh, so what we want to do is um, find a technology, hopefully an optical technology, that will bridge the gap, um, that will cover these distances in a data center from say hundreds of meters to several kilometers, and that will do that with um, a lower cost so that it becomes a really a viable technology for these high volume applications, but that still keeps the performance that we need. Um, and uh, another application um, that is asking for a technology like this um, is high performance computing or supercomputers. Um, again, not something that everybody uses every day, but uh, I'm sure that uh, you've looked at the weather predictions. Um, some of you, uh, you know, may have at least read about or have experience with some of these uh, research applications. Um, any large scale simulation is, is done usually on a supercomputer like this. Um, finance analysis, smart grid, there are a lot of these applications that are run uh, on supercomputers. Uh, and here's an example. Uh, this is the uh, Sequoia uh, IBM Blue Gene Q system. Um, this was, when it came out, it was uh, the number one uh, supercomputer. Right now it's, it's sitting at number three on the top 500 list. Um, and all of these orange cables that you can see here, these are all optics. Um, so there's about one million optical fibers um, that are supporting this very large supercomputer. Um, but the technology right now is still, these are very, uh, these are manually assembled parts. Um, they have, you know, components that you've got little lenses, little lasers, little detectors that are all put together usually in, in large factories. Um, so it's still a fairly expensive technology. Um, right now, uh, the cost of these uh, optical interconnects is around 10% of the total system cost. Um, and that's kind of, that's all right for now. Um, but if you project going forward, um, we can look at the estimations and very rapidly, the cost of the optical interconnects go above 100% of the total allowed system cost. Um, and you can't really have that. I mean, you need to have some uh, funds left over to, to buy the actual processors. Um, so this is another application where we're really looking for a low cost, um, but still high performance technology. Um, and so, of course, when the community saw these problems, um, one place that we looked, and probably the first place that we looked, is to silicon, um, because we know a very high performance, large volume uh, technology, um, and that's the complementary metal oxide semiconductor uh, CMOS process that provides all of our computer chips today. Um, so we, uh, they're produced on these large silicon wafers that can provide many chips, so high volume keeps costs low. Um, and it's also extremely advanced technology because it's been developed for so many years in such an important industry. Um, so we get, uh, they get ultra high yield that's required. You know, if you have to produce a million parts per year, or several million, you can't have you know, half of them failing. They really all have to work. Um, so we would get ultra high yield um, and also the dimensional control that we need to provide high performance op uh, optics, at least that we would like. Um, but of course, this is an electronics process. So the question is, can we add optics? Um, and of course, the, the first problem is that silicon is unfortunately not a very good optical material. Um, so that, that was the first hurdle to, uh, to jump over. Um, but over the years, the community has, has put a lot of research effort and a lot of time. Um, and in fact, we've, we've made it a pretty good optical material. We can get um, 
Yeah, pretty much matching performance from silicon um, in, in many of the components that we need for uh, optical data communication. So this is great. We can do it on silicon um, in the lab. But uh, the other issue here is that in order to get these ultra high yields and dimensional control, um, there are very tight process controls in CMOS fabrication facilities. So if I went to somebody who works in a, in a CMOS um, fab and I asked them, OK, well, can we just change this etch time by 5%? Can you do that? They'll have a conniption fit. Um, you just you can't do that and still keep the performance and the reliability that you need for this type of a very fine scale technology. Um, so it's it's been quite a development effort um, to bring these two things together. Um, but but we at IBM have uh, have been doing that over the past uh, ten or so years, um, and also of course other institutions have been uh, working on the same project. Um, but what we've done at IBM is we took a standard CMOS processing flow, a number of steps. This is what everybody is comfortable with um, in the CMOS foundry. And we just added a couple of things. Um, so we added a couple of levels here and there um, to make our optical devices. So what we've done is we had a, a minimal changes that, that everybody signed off on. You know, you have to get, uh, to make these changes, you have to get you know, sign-offs all up and down the chain, you know, people running around in circles. But we, we convinced them that this was OK. Um, and so now we have photonics as a new feature in standard CMOS. Um, so what we can do is we have our, our regular transistors here, like you would have in any computer chip, um, right next to it. In fact, on the same level of silicon, um, we can have these optical devices, um, a modulator that turns, uh, turns the light on and off. Oh, what just happened? <laughs> that turns the light on and off um, to take the electrical signal and put it into an optical signal. Um, so we get light pulses out. Um, and then we have a detector that reads in that optical signal, all those pulses, transmit, transfers those pulses back into the electrical domain. Um, so what we have here in, uh, in this single chip um, is a, a monolithically integrated uh, silicon photonics technology. Um, so IBM had the first uh, sub-100 nanometer node uh, monolithic technology. Um, this is important because the smaller the node, the better the performance. So our technology um, is good for uh, 25 gigabit per second operation, which is where the market is right now. That's what everybody is asking for. Um, and uh, we can make these in very large scales. You know, we can, we can supply the market of millions and millions of parts. Um, and we can do that by taking advantage of all of the CMOS infrastructure that's there already for electrical chips. Um, so everything is, is basically the same, except for a couple of changes that we've made. Um, and uh, one additional point I want to emphasize here is um, not only are we taking advantage of the highly advanced um, CMOS uh, fabrication technology, you know, the, all the equipment, the silicon, the machines, the metals, um, we're also taking advantage of all the software and enablement tools, um, the, whole, the whole package that come along with that. Um, so if you're, you know, currently the state the state of, of most of the optics market right now is you'll, you'll be a, a graduate student or you'll, you'll be a PhD working in a company and you'll take one or, or maybe if you're, you're doing a heroic experiment, you'll connect a couple devices together and you'll design all of those, you'll put them all together, you have to understand all of the, the physics behind it um, and then you can do your experiment. You'll have a couple of components. Um, so in that case, you can, do all of, you can do all of it yourself. You can understand the devices, how they work. You can put it together. You know, it takes maybe how much training, you know, 15 years of training altogether to be able to do that, but you can do it. Um, but once you, I mean, in, in the electronics industry, you know, there are millions and millions of transistors in every single computer chip. Um, if we want to take that as a model, if we really want to get there with optics and have this large complexity, large scale integration, um, we want to make this simpler so that not everybody has to be a device designer. You know, you can't, you can't both design the transistor and design the architecture of your, your computer. It doesn't, it's too much for one person. Um, so what this infrastructure in CMOS enables us to do um, is, uh, for example, we'll have a, a library of components. In this case, we provide both electro electronic components and photonic components. Um, that's already provided to you as the designer. Um, so you can just place them together. Those are all qualified. They have, um, they're guaranteed to produce the same way every time uh, within a certain range of parameters. Uh, they have models associated with them. You can do simulations so that you know how the system is going to work. Um, and uh, we've got design rules such that if your waveguide has a gap in it, you know, it'll flag and let you know. Um, and we have matching of layout and schematics so that you know that what you made is actually what you wanted to make. Um, and that's what's 
I, I would call this a real qualitative change in the way that optics designers are, are doing their designs. Um, because it's rather than just doing a couple devices together, it's really necessary. Um, this isn't even a particularly large system I'm showing it. This is just an example. But um, in order to build something this large, you really need to have all this verification. You can't do it all by hand. It's too much. Um, so using these CMOS technology um, lets us lay out complex um, both electronic and photonic circuits without having a PhD in optical device physics, which enables, I think, the design of, of new levels of hierarchy of complexity. Um, and there are a number of potential impacts going forward. Um, I think silicon photonics is a, is a pretty well-hyped field these days. Uh, it's very exciting. Um, near term are, are the applications that I've talked about um, in data centers, you know, cloud computing, web search, um, also high-performance computing, um, large-scale simulation, drug discovery, data, analy data analytics. Big data is a big thing these days. Um, also some applications in networks, you know, maybe moving into the telecom space somewhat, depending on, you know, performance requirements and cost. Um, over the longer term, of course, this is very speculative. There's a lot of research that needs to be done before we can get there, a lot of performance improvements. Um, but I think the community has, um, has a really good start on these things, and, and so we can look forward and, and hope that eventually this technology will make its way um, into personal computing um, for maybe data transfer when we need, I don't know, a, a video screen this big with you know millions and millions of pixels. Maybe you would need this kind of technology. Um, Many core systems, you can imagine um, having all of these CPUs together, um, if they're producing even more data than they are now, the electrical connections aren't going to work even over these distances. So we can imagine a chip that's interconnected with optics between the memory and the CPU, between all the different cores. Um, these are forward-looking applications, but, uh, but these are you know, what we're hoping for. Um, and then there are also other applications. People are using um, silicon photonics as disposable lab uh, tests. Um, Say it's a cheap silicon chip. You can do it. You can you can do your optical testing. You can throw it away, um, and uh, environmental sensors. And also, I think there will be some new applications that we're not even aware of right now. As we move from the several transistor model to the millions and millions of transistor model um, in photonics, once we have all these components, there are new things that we're going to be able to do. Um, and I just want to briefly also give a background of of, of my path, uh, since this is a sort of about women in optics and. Um, in our experiences. So um, I'll say in childhood, um, I had a somewhat usual, unusual experience in that uh, none of my immediate family, my parents, none of them were scientists. So um, I sort of got into that, I don't know how exactly, on my own. Um, and I had a, a, a great interest in these popular science books. So that was, that was really my gateway. And I was always encouraged uh, by everyone who saw me reading these books to, to really go on in science. So I was, I was lucky in that sense. Um, and then I, I did get an early start. Um, I, at, when I was 13 years old, um, I attended the Mary Baldwin College. Um, it's a program for exceptionally gifted. Um, it's a program for young students to start college early. Um, and, uh, and after a year there, I transferred to Bryn Mawr College, um, where I got my uh, bachelor's in physics. Um, and I will say both of these schools were women's colleges. Um, and for me, that, that did have a large impact. Um, especially, I mean, I knew myself as a, as a young student. Um, I, I felt more comfortable in this sort of nurturing environment. It was small, got a lot of interaction time with the professors, a lot of female role models. Um, it was great for me. Um, I do also want to say, you know, these sort of small classes, nurturing environments are often presented as a women's issue, that, that women will be more likely to stay um, in physics and optics um, if we have these, these nurturing small environments. I, I'd rather say this is a people issue. Um, you know, women span the whole spectrum. Some are, are, are very, you know, go-getter and aggressive, and they would love to be in a uh, more competitive environment. Um, some of us, you know, I wanted for the beginning of my career um, to have a, you know, a lot of confidence and to be in a nurturing environment um, so that then I could go forth. Um, but I think there are a lot of men also who, who would benefit from that experience. Um, there's many different ways to, to do things. Um, and uh, so, so after uh, this experience, um, at Bryn Mawr College, I went to uh, California Institute of Technology for my PhD, and I will say that was a, that was definitely a hard-charging, uh, competitive environment, um, and I really benefited from the confidence that I developed um, in my undergraduate career, where I had a lot of support and a lot of mentors. Um, and then uh, after that, I moved into industry, um, mostly because I wanted to make something. Um, I really it was exciting to me, the idea of going out there, working for a company that has access to the resources to take something that we design and put it out in the world. Um, so that's what I've been doing. Um, I also want to highlight OSA's role um, really throughout my career. Um, 
going to conferences and, and now more you know, participating in conference committees, um, peer review, and now uh, being an associate editor for a journal has really connected me with all these other researchers in the field. It really, one, it gives you a bird's eye view of what's actually going on, you know, what's important. It lets you see, oh, maybe that'll be the next big thing. There are a lot of papers on that. Um, it also builds professional, you know, professional collaborations, or even just knowing people. You know, if you have some question in your lab, you say, oh, I think I know that guy who's an expert in it. I'm going to send an email. Um, and usually they'll answer. So um, OSA has been very helpful in that for me throughout my career. And I uh, just want to thank the team. Um, through all IBM folks uh, working on this project. Um, and thank you.